Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this update webinar with Fiore Gold. My name is uh, Jacob Willby. I'm a VP of Research here at Red Cloud, one of its uh, newest hires. I have with me today uh, Tim Warman, CEO of uh, Fiore Gold, uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, we'll begin today's webinar with a presentation from Tim uh, to provide an overview of uh, the company and uh, update you on its projects. After that, after that I'll ask Tim uh, a couple of questions to give you time to register any questions you may have. And, uh, and then we'll take questions uh, from you guys. Uh, before we start, we have to go to everyone's favorite section, disclosures. <laughs> Uh, so for Fiore, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call or webcast that I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of their corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud, uh, please see the full disclaimer and disclosures on our most recent Fiore post on our website. And I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we know that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Red Cloud specific disclosures related to Fiore Gold are that a, a member of Red Cloud Securities team or member's household serves as a director officer or advisory board member of the issuer. A member of Red Cloud Securities has visited or viewed material operations of the issuer. In the past 12 months, Red Cloud Securities has been retained under a surface or advisory agreement by the issuer. Red Cloud Securities or a member of the Red Cloud Securities team or household has a long position in the shares and or options of the subject issuer being Fiore Gold. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'd now like to welcome Tim Warman, who is CEO of uh, Fiore Gold to uh, update us with his presentation and uh, I'll speak to you after that. Thanks, Jake, um, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to uh, quickly run through uh, the corporate presentation, give you a bit of an update, and then as Jake said, we'll switch over to some questions. So Fiori Gold, a growth-oriented US gold producer. Uh, the next slide has our standard uh, disclaimer, forward-looking statements, uh, and you can read that, as Jake said, on our website. Go to the next slide. So the key value drivers at Fiori really are um, expanding our pan mine. Pan is our kind of core asset. It's uh, an open pit heap leach mine in, uh, in Nevada. Uh, excellent jurisdiction. Uh, we've been ramping up the production at that mine over the last couple of years since we made the acquisition. Uh, we did 34,000 ounces in fiscal year 2018. And I'll just note that our fiscal year ends at the end of September, so we have a bit of an offset year. We're just starting into fiscal year 2020 now. But we just published the results, uh, production results of fiscal year 2019. We did 41,000 uh, ounces for the full year at a run of mine uh, operation. And in fiscal year 2020, we're not yet providing formal gu guidance, but as we switch over from run of mine uh, to fully crushed ore placement on the leach pad, we're estimating somewhere in that kind of 45 to 50,000 ounce range. And we'll provide uh, a bit more uh, detailed guidance uh, when we publish our financials in January. Uh, and I should add that uh, drilling is underway there to uh, increase the resource and reserve. And we're looking to have a new life of mine plan and resource update out uh, towards the middle of next year. Uh, in terms of growth projects, we have a, a really nice organic growth project in the form of our Gold Rock project. Uh, it's about eight miles away within the same claim uh, boundary as PAN. Uh, we have all of the federal permits required for mining and processing there. And that, I think that alone puts us about four or five years ahead of any other project uh, in the U.S. right now. Um, we've just wrapped up a 10,000 meter drill program uh, of RC and core drilling uh, that's aiming to uh, better characterize the resource there and uh, try and expand the resource base. And that's all ahead of a PEA that's going to be coming out uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and then really on top of that, um, you know, organic growth, we'd like to look at uh, uh, some strategic M&A activities targeting complementary operations, open pit heap leach uh, type operations. Uh, and obviously, with that growth, uh, we're looking to get into that 100 to 150,000 ounce range uh, in the next couple of years. 
Uh, and really, again, looking at higher multiples, uh, higher valuations, better access to capital, and, and just a larger profile overall. We go to the next slide. So the Pan Mine, our producing asset, is a typical open pit heat bleach mine in, uh, in Nevada near the town of, uh, of Eureka, on the south end of the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. You can go to the next slide. Uh, there's a nice uh, aerial view from May of this year. You can see there's two pits at the mine, the south pit and the north pit. Uh, leach pads in the center there, uh, the ADR plant uh, where we recover the gold. It's really a fairly simple mine. It's a simple layout. Um, we picked this asset up in 2016 from uh, the bankruptcy of Midway Gold. Uh, which had built the mine back in 2015 and, and very quickly gone bankrupt. Um, we had uh, some time to address a lot of the technical issues that Midway ran into. And I should stress that Midway's problems weren't just technical. They also had a, a very awkward uh, capital structure with a lot of debt. And, uh, and that really didn't give them time to sort out the problems that they ran into uh, when they first started mining there. Um, Fiori currently has no debt. Uh, we haven't had any debt since we started other than a small uh, equipment finance facility on our crusher. Um, and that really gave us a lot of flexibility to fix the problems, the technical problems, the operational problems that, uh, that Midway had. And I think uh, our results over the last two years show that we've got that mine uh, operating very nicely now and, uh, and generating some pretty decent cash flow. And we can go to the next slide. So as you can see, uh, gold ounces uh, produced over the last uh, five quarters. We just released the uh, Q4 and full year production for 2019. Um, We've averaged over the last four quarters of about 10 and a half thousand ounces uh, per quarter. Uh, so 41,000, roughly 41,500 ounces uh, this year, which was comfortably in the middle of our guidance range. Um, Q4 production results were a little lower. Uh, it's primarily a result of a planned lower grade. Uh, we were expecting that lower grade in the mine plan. It was always gonna be a slightly lower uh, production quarter. And also some teething issues we've had as we switch over from run a mine ore uh, to fully crushed ore. That's taken a little longer than we thought. Um, that slowed down some of the, uh, the mining rates, but that's getting back on track and should be fully back on track uh, in the current quarter. Uh, all in sustaining costs over the last uh, four quarters have sat between sort of $1,000 and $1,100 uh, an ounce all in sustaining cost. Um, been a little higher in the last quarter and we'll, we'll continue to see some cost pressure there uh, because we're in a higher stripping phase. Uh, life of mine strip ratio is about 1.6 and the current strip rate in the last quarter was about 2.3. And we'll continue to sit in that kind of 2 to 2.2 range uh, for the next couple of quarters before we drop right back down uh, to about a one to one strip uh, in the middle of next year. Um, and, you know, and so this is kind of a temporary period. It's uh, it's not unexpected. It was in the mine plan. Um, and uh, and I think we're managing it very well. Uh, productivity is certainly uh, up considerably and we're being able to maintain that uh, required stripping ratio. Uh, as you can see from the operating cash flow metrics, uh, PANS generated approximately $3 million in operating cash flow per quarter over the last uh, three quarters. Uh, this quarter uh, coming up, obviously, with the lower production and the higher strip ratio uh, will be a little lighter than that. But uh, but again, that's a short-term thing. And really, you know, we're, we're trying not to operate the business on a quarter-to-quarter on a -quarter basis. We, uh, you know, we'll, we're always happy to crow about a, uh, a record quarter of gold production. But fundamentally, the switch over from run a mine uh, to uh, crushed ore was really for the long-term benefit of the, uh, of the operation of the company. And, uh, and so we're not too concerned about a few teething pains as we go through that, especially as it seems to be getting back on track. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So uh, pan mine right now is, uh, is pretty much optimized with the addition of the crusher. We think that'll add about six to 7,000 ounces a year. Uh, again, we'll provide more detailed guidance as we go into our financials uh, in, in January. Uh, and really the focus now is on uh, targeting mine life extension. Um, we did a 2018 drilling program to uh, increase the resource and reserve uh, base and increase the mine life, and that was quite successful. Uh, we extended the mine life into 2023, and we had more than 50% growth in the inferred resources. And in September of this year, we started our second uh, drilling program, about 10,000 meters of RC drilling, uh, maybe with some core drilling as well at PAN. Again, targeting, uh, increasing the resource base, increasing the reserve base, and extending the mine life. And for the first time ever, we've been able to uh, um, uh, allocate some drilling meters to drilling some of these more distal targets that you see on that slide in red. And these were targets that were identified by the previous owners, but really never got around to drill testing them as they focused on building the pan mine. Um, so we're pretty excited that uh, later this year, or uh, sorry, later in 2020, we'll be able to target some of those and really look at the kind of uh, more regional upside uh, at pan. But again, we're pretty confident uh, that we'll be able to add uh, to the mine life and, and continue to do that uh, as we go on uh, with mining a pan. Let's go to the next slide. 
So with PAN pretty much optimized, now the, the story really turns to our, our organic growth project called Gold Rock. And Gold Rock, as I said, is about eight miles away. Uh, there's an old open pit there, a small open pit that exposes the geology really nicely. Uh, this is from the, the 1990s uh, when it was operated by Echo Bay. Um, and uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, one of the interesting things about Gold Rock is you can see the proximity there to PAN. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, as I say, it's got a current resource of uh, 238,000 ounces of indicated and 180,000 of inferred. It's about 60% higher grade than PAN, uh, which appears to have good recovery based on the metallurgical work we've done to date. Um, and the interesting thing is Midway uh, permitted that project at a federal level, or at least started to permit that project, and we completed the process um, without any kind of a 43101 report. They did it all based on internal economic and technical studies. And so our first task has really been to get some of those uh, 43101 studies out there in the market. So we'll put a PEA out and it'll be the first PEA ever on the site. Uh, we'll have that out in uh, uh, by the end of this year. Um, and again, targeting uh, straight into a feasibility study uh, in 2020 and then into a production decision by 2021 to try and push that uh, production at Gold Rock uh, as quickly as we can. Um, and we just completed a 10,000 meter drilling program there. Uh, we did primarily RC. Uh, we did about uh, 5,000 meters of uh, core drilling, which is just wrapping up. I think that's on that last hole. Uh, and we'll continue to have uh, drill results from that program out over the next few months. Uh, we've got metallurgical work underway and again, uh, leading into a PEA by year end. But one of the exciting things about Gold Rock is that the exploration potential there is really significant. There's about a 16 kilometer long trend of mineralization, of alteration, of golden soils, of arsenic and antimony in soils that's really untested. And it's the similarity uh, between the geology at Gold Rock and at Kinross's Bald Mountain Mountain, just to the north of us, that led Kinross to make a strategic investment in us back in uh, 2017 when we acquired the assets. And they're still shareholders and, uh, and still very supportive. Um, and I think they really like the exploration upside there, as do we, of course. And we're hoping to get uh, a look at some of those uh, distal exploration targets as well uh, next year once we wrap up the PEA. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the PEA is really going to target um, uh, looking at uh, Gold Rock as really a complementary operation to our existing PAN mine. You can see some of the uh, infrastructure there. You can see PAN up in the upper left, about eight miles away. We have Gold Rock down to the southeast. Uh, we're just finishing up permitting on the connecting road between PAN and Gold Rock. That's the, uh, the road that will allow us to get back and forth between the two operations in something like 20 minutes. Uh, we're currently it's about an hour and a half drive uh, on a very roundabout route. Uh, the power line, which you can see is that dotted yellow line coming in from the left-hand side of the map. That's the existing power line for the pan mine, and you can see it passes right by Gold Rock, and we'll be able to tap onto that power line uh, to power the uh, facilities of Gold Rock. Really, we're looking at, again, using a lot of the management team, using a lot of the resources currently at PAN, uh, exploring opportunities to cut the CapEx and the OpEx. So, for instance, uh, the current uh, idea is that we would put an open pit mine and leach pads and the uh, carbon columns uh, to recover the gold onto the carbon at Pan, or sorry, at Gold Rock, but then really truck that carbon up to Pan and use the existing ADR facility and the carbon handling circuit and the refinery uh, that's already there. Uh, we'd also plan to use the uh, the assay lab at uh, Pan and use a lot of the same staff and senior management teams and admin teams and and, and whatnot. And again, really targeting uh, both capex and uh, and opex savings there. Let's go to the next slide. I mentioned we've been drilling at, uh, at Gold Rock and you can see a, a map there that's very cluttered with drill holes and we've been adding to that clutter. Um, we've done a, a lot of our sea drilling there and are, are just wrapping up some core drilling there. Um, and, and really the initial results are confirming what we expected to see, which is confirming the resource model, confirming the geology, confirming the grades and the continuity of mineralization and actually filling in a lot of gaps in the uh, existing resource model where, where there had been under drilled gaps uh, from the uh, previous operators. Uh, this is the first drilling that's been done by, uh, by uh, Fiori Gold uh, since we acquired the property on, on this particular area. And again, PEA will be out and resource update out by, uh, by year end. Let's go to the next slide. We have two other properties uh, that are kind of interesting, and I'll, I'll just talk about one of them right now. It's called the Golden Eagle property. We can go to the next slide. Golden Eagle is a property up in Washington State near the Canadian border and not far from Kinross's Kettle River Mill and uh, Buckhorn Mine that are currently going into closure. It's in the historic Republic Mining District that produced about 4 million ounces of uh, gold from the late 1800s through to the, uh, the well, just recently with the, uh, with the closure of uh, the two Kinross mines. Um, 
it's what we think is really an overlooked asset with a significant expiration upside and optionality. So if you look at the current historical resource, I'll, I'll remind you that's a non-43101 historical resource estimate. Um, there's about 1.74 million ounces at 1.89 grams per ton there. Um, but keep in mind that was done back in 2009 at a $750 gold price. Um, so obviously if you put in a current gold price, uh, that looks a lot more uh, interesting. Um, we've done an internal study where we looked at a pit constrained uh, um, uh, resource model there. The uh, problem is that the pit, which you can see in that kind of green shell there, would impinge on the adjacent claims held by Hecla Mining. And uh, Hecla is currently drilling off their own project uh, next door. Um, we've had some discussions with Hecla about unitizing the area. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, Hecla's uh, like a lot of the larger companies, is a bit slower to respond, but we're hoping to make some progress on that uh, this year. Uh, in any case, it costs us about $10,000 a year to hold that project, uh, so we, we really like the optionality of that. We also have a couple of projects in Chile that uh, sort of historical remnants that we're looking to, uh, to JV, and again, we've had some interest in those projects recently as well. Next slide. Capital structure is pretty similar, uh, pretty simple, 97.7 million shares outstanding. 32 million options and warrants, all of them uh, fairly significantly out of the money. Um, we had at the last reported quarter, 9.7 US million in cash, 22 million in networking capital, um, and a market cap that sits at about US 29 million or Canadian 39 million. So what you're seeing there really is, you know, effectively the company is trading for its, uh, its networking capital and its cash. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's one of the main reasons we think the, the company's, uh, you know, fairly undervalued at the moment. And, uh, and, uh, you know, a good proposition for investors. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have no debt other than a small uh, equipment finance facility uh, for the crusher that we put in uh, earlier this year. Next slide. Um, again, looking at uh, metrics relative to our peer group, we think we're significantly undervalued both on an EV per gold resource ounce or an EV per uh, gold production ounce. Uh, we're very much at the low end of the scale there. Uh, but obviously, you know, as we grow, uh, we think we'll get uh, get revalued and and bring uh, Gold Rock on in particular. And conceptually, you know, we see Gold Rock plus Pan together getting us up organically over that 100,000 ounce a year uh, production mark. But again, a lot has to go right uh, between now and then. Uh, next slide. So I'll just wrap up with uh, some of the catalysts uh, both accomplished uh, over the past year and, and coming up in the future. Uh, we've got the Pan mine successfully ramped up and, and generating cash flow in most quarters. Uh, we've extended the mine life into 2023. Uh, we've started drilling uh, to continue to extend that uh, resource and reserve base and, and continue to extend that mine life. We've got the Gold Rock Federal Permit in hand. Uh, we're working on a PEA for that uh, project. And uh, we've got the crusher installed and operating at PAN. And I just should stress that, you know, all of that crusher installation, the bulk of that, uh, the drilling at PAN, the drilling at Gold Rock, all the metallurgical work and everything else, we've been able to fund that all from cash flow from PAN. It's a small mine. It's relatively low grade but it's a nice little operation, very efficient. And, uh, and it means we haven't had to go back to the market. So we haven't issued any new shares uh, in two years, a little over two years since we acquired these assets. So they've, uh, they've really done what we, uh, what we hope they would do, which is to fund the growth of the company internally. Uh, coming up, Gold Rock resource expansion drilling and met results, uh, Gold Rock PEA by year end, PAN resource expansion that's currently underway. We'll have a uh, resource update and a new life of mine plan uh, mid year next year. And, and then hopefully some consolidation of similar sized or smaller uh, producers to kind of grow the company, uh, both organically and through uh, some strategic M&A. And then hopefully maybe unlock some value in Golden Eagle and our Chilean projects. And that's it, thank you. Okay, uh, just to give everybody a couple of seconds to uh, uh, type in some questions. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions for, for you, Tim. Um, firstly, uh, could you just tell us when you joined the company, uh, how did that come about, and what were you most excited about the opportunity uh, at the time? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, my background uh, prior had been uh, uh, primarily in exploration and development stories. I was with uh, Aurelian Resources, which made the Fruit of Del Norte discovery back in, uh, in uh, 2006. I was the VP corporate development there, and uh, of course we sold that asset uh, in 2008 to Kinross. Um, and then I was with Delradian again, another kind of exploration development story in Northern Ireland. But um, Fiori actually started off as an exploration story, Latin America focused. And then we started looking for some more advanced assets uh, and, and looked a lot of assets in Latin America. But then somebody showed us the, uh, the old Midway assets, the Pan and Gold Rock and, and Gold Needle assets. And the more we looked at them, the more we liked them. And we picked those up in, um, in, uh, through a merger with a private company called GRP in, uh, in 2017. 
And, uh, and so although I'd been with Fiore uh, for a couple of years before that, I really, it was September 2017, we put the kind of producing asset together. And I think it's, it's, been, a, it's been an interesting learning curve, um, but it's, uh, it's certainly an exciting business to be in. And, and certainly, a, you know, you're looking at it more as a, as a, as a long-term business as opposed to a, you know, the more, I guess, uh, you know, treasure hunting of the exploration uh, side of things. Although we do have some nice exploration assets as well. Sure. Um, just uh, one, one other question uh, I always like to ask management when I, when I can is, uh, what, what's your, your, what keeps you up at night right now? What is your biggest concern for the company? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, like anything, right? You're, uh, you're, you're, you're looking at how the business is running, keeping an eye on the mine, keeping an eye on uh, various other things as we go along. Um, you know, probably the biggest concern for any producer in Nevada right now is, um, is uh, manpower. It's a very competitive labor market. Um, that's obviously creating some cost pressure and really just, just challenges in, in finding and retaining staff. I think um, we have a nice small operation. Uh, it's not a big company atmosphere. Everybody knows everybody. And I think that's helped us, uh, helped us uh, attract and retain staff. But again, we're having to go through, you know, some unconventional uh, hiring, um, you know, things that, uh, that you probably wouldn't normally do in a, in a, in a less competitive market. But, uh, but so far, you know, we've been managing just fine. Okay, great. So we uh, we have a few questions now, um, and uh, we'll start with the first one that's there. Um, just asking about your hedging philosophy, and when you see recent higher gold pl prices flowing through to the income state. Yeah. So I mean, our our strategy generally is that we're we're not big fans of hedging. However, we will do it. Uh, we're, you know, we're a single asset producer. Um, and so we will do it when we have some, uh, you know, committed capital that we have to spend. And so we're currently just running out the end of some uh, um, zero cost callers that we put in uh, that when we first put them in was looking very good um, in the current gold price there. I think it's sitting in the sort of 1350 range, uh, the callers. Um, obviously, it's looking less good. But at the same time, uh, you know, we had some committed uh, uh, capital expenditures and you want to make sure that, you know, you're protecting the company for the long term. Um, you know, having said that, those callers run out in November, and I don't see any reason, you know, coming up that we would uh, we would look at putting those in again. I think, you know, to the greatest extent possible, we would uh, we you know we want to participate in the uh, in the gold price. And I should say that the callers were only on a portion of our uh, of our uh, production. So, great. Okay. Um, next question um, asks about the uh, strip ratio. Uh, what is the strip ratio profile over the next few quarters? Yeah, so um, I think you'll see in the in the last quarter the strip ratio was about two point three, and we'll see a similar kind of strip ratio in that kind of two to two point two range probably for the next uh, two quarters, and then sort of in mid uh, twenty twenty uh, the strip ratio starts to drop down and it actually gets down uh, to about one uh, to one, which is actually below the life of mine strip ratio as we get into that. So we've got a few quarters of that slightly higher strip, but again, one of the nice things we're seeing. Uh, particularly with the crusher, it's made mining a lot more efficient. So we're seeing a lot better productivity, uh, you know, in the uh, in the mining phase of things. Uh, a lot better productivity from our uh, from our mining contractor, and that's really allowed us to handle that higher strip ratio a lot more comfortably. Uh, so, so that that's really where we are with the strip. Okay. Um, next question um, asks. Sorry. Uh, uh, we have a, a fan from California uh, who's a big fan of the, the jurisdiction and the cash flow asking, um, uh, are you done with your financings except for Gold Rock, uh, which obviously you'll, you'll need to uh, come up with uh, funding to develop that asset? And um, how much do you think you would need to develop? It? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously the, the more detailed, uh, you know, capital cost uh, will come out of the PEA, uh, which will be out by year end. But in general, we're kind of, you know, and, and this is a bit of an arm wavy number with, a, with fairly big error bars on it. But we're sort of guiding in that kind of 50 to 70 million dollar range uh, to build it. Um, again, we're going to try and leverage as much of the existing infrastructure at PAN as we can. Um, you know, and and so far, you know, again, touch wood, we've been fairly successful at being able to fund all of our programs uh, out of cash flow. Um, we're pretty confident we can continue to do that. Um, and again, it's somewhat gold price dependent. Obviously, at fifteen hundred dollar gold, particularly as those uh, those uh, callers come off in uh, November, 
Um, I think we're we're confident at those prices. We can certainly uh, manage all of the uh, you know the expenses we have both at Pan and uh, at Gold Rock to to advance that. Um, once we get into actual construction financing at Gold Rock, that's a different story, and we're going to have to take on uh, you know project debt of some form or another. One of the nice things is that um, we've already start, started talking to uh, various potential lenders uh, for that, and we've seen a lot of interest. Um, and I think primarily there's been a lot of interest because we're not trying to uh, finance a brand new kind of greenfields project with a management team that's never done this before. We've got an operating mine that's cash flowing right next door. And that, that gives lenders a lot more uh, comfort, I think, in talking to us. And I think I'm hoping that will translate into a lower cost of capital as well. Great. Okay. Uh, another question, um, a very good question. <laughs> How soon might Gold Rock come into production if everything goes as planned? Yeah, so we're trying to be a little conservative. I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to adopt the philosophy in general with this company of, of uh, under-promising and over-delivering. But um, our goal right now uh, is that uh, we can start a feasibility study uh, next year, assuming the PEA looks positive. Um, we would guide about 18 months to finish that P, uh, the P, the, sorry, the feasibility study because there's a lot of drilling to be done to convert resources to reserves. There's geotechnical work to be done. There's metallurgical work to be done in engineering. Um, and then really we'd be looking at about a 12 to 18 month build. So conservatively by the end of 2022, uh, we'd be finished construction and starting to uh, put uh, ore on the leach pads and produce gold. So that's kind of that late 2022 early 2023. Now, could we accelerate that? Yeah, we probably could, particularly if gold prices stay high. Um, but uh, but again, we're trying to be conservative and say, look, that's kind of the date we're looking at. Um, and uh, and if we can if we can do it faster, we will. OK, that's, uh, that's certainly fair. Uh, next question. Um, any update on your Chilean assets? Um, uh, yeah, so the, 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 we have two uh, remaining exploration projects in Chile. Um, uh, one of them is near uh, Yamana's El Peñon mine. In fact, uh, it's it's just right next door to their concessions there and very close to the mill. Um, and the other one is a high sulfidation exploration target up in a uh, slightly higher elevation near um, Goldfield's um, uh, Solaris Norte project, uh, which is a spectacular find at the north end of the Maracunga Belt. Um, those ones, you know, we like those as exploration targets, but it's tough to focus on Chile right now. So we have been in touch with a few people, uh, particularly at the recent Beaver Creek and the uh, the Denver Gold Show. And uh, and so we've got people looking at them right now, but really nothing beyond that. Uh, it's early stages still. I'm hoping we can find a, a partner to take those on. Okay. Um, next question. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any new ones there. So I'll uh, I'll ask you a question I, sure. I had for you. Um, you talk about uh, Gold Rock being already federally permitted, yep. uh, but um, sometimes when people say a project is permitted, yeah. it's not 100% right. yeah, permitted. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm guessing there there's some things that would need to be done before it was absolutely yeah. 100%. Permitted. Yeah. So the, the the permitting process in the U.S. typically works that you you get your federal permits, which are your kind of larger permits that involve public hearings and consultations and lots of interagency uh, participation and, and whatnot into it, stakeholders and all the rest. And then <clears throat> once you've got that in place, and that we got back in uh, September of 2018, um, you go on and you do a lot more of the detailed engineering, at which point you start to do some of your state level permitting. Now, obviously, state level permitting in Nevada is a lot more simple than it would be, say, in you know New York or, or you know something like sure. that. Uh, it's a mining friendly state. The, the regulators know mining. We've had great relationships with the state regulators because they've already seen our operation at Pan. So we've kind of established a, a reputation as good operators there. Um, and so we'd be going in, you know, as we get into the, you know, the end of the feasibility study, we've got more detailed design. We know exactly where things are going to go. We know quantities of throughput and all the rest of those kind of things. We can do our, our dust modeling and things like that. Uh, we'll know the layout of the, the 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 leach ponds and things like that. So that's when you go into that kind of state permitting, and you know, probably that's a six to eight month uh, permitting schedule. We would allow ourselves about a year to do that, which I think is more than reasonable in Nevada. And we tie that into that whole kind of feasibility and construction timeline. So that's that that state permitting is built into the timeline that I spoke about. Right. So, but if you were starting from scratch on a a greenfield yeah, project. Yeah. 
uh, you'd have to go through the federal permitting process, and that would be many years. Really. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a there's a lot of talk about um, you know people saying that under the new U.S. administration that the permitting timelines are are shortened drastically, and people are going to get through a full permitting cycle in a year. Um, you know, that, that'd be great. I'm all you know, and the first time somebody does it, I'll be I'll be cheering from the sidelines. But uh, but that hasn't been the experience uh, in the U.S. Certainly, yeah. um, you know, and if you look at HUD Bay in Arizona, or you look at you know. Uh, you know, just other companies permitting projects in the U.S. It can take time, um, you know, and, and I think the fact that we've built up a, a good relationship and a good reputation with the regulators is, is helping us on that. Mm -hmm. But it still took, I mean, Midway started the environmental uh, background collection for the permitting process for uh, Gold Rock. And admittedly, this was somewhat disrupted by the bankruptcy of Midway, and then we took it over. But I mean, they did start them back in 2010, and we permitted it in 2018. So that was a, an eight-year process. Now that yeah. was probably excessively long, but um, but yeah, uh, the fact that that it is federally permitted means that really we're in the driver's seat for the timeline on that. Right. Um, there is a, another question there. Um, good question, asking if you see any more midway type deals still out there. Uh, could we go after companies that are you know sort of bankruptcy <laughs> or in trouble? Um, I mean, look, I, I I think I think we. We pride ourselves on being good operators. Um, you know, we're we're making pretty decent cash flow on on what I think by anyone's standard is a relatively low grade mine. Um, it's a small mine, um, but and and I really want to emphasize this: we've done this without a single lost time injury in uh, four years now uh, since that that team has been working there. Um, we've won the small uh, mine safety award from the Nevada Mining Association. We've been the been the safest small mine in Nevada for four years running. Right. Um, yeah. And and that safety to me is a leading indicator of uh, how good your operating team is. And if you ever run into a company that doesn't want to talk about their safety record, I would run away very quickly. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about ours. Yeah, that's, um, that's a very good point. Yeah. And, and so I think our operations team, we see other assets out there that we think we could run better. And I, I, I'm not trying to be particularly cocky about that, but I think, you know, we look at it and say, look, we're running our operation very well. And there are some other operations that are struggling for, you know, a whole variety of reasons. But um, but I think we could take our experience that we've built up running PAN uh, and, and we'll obviously we'll apply that to Gold Rock as well. But we think there are other assets out there, um, you know, that we could that we could run better and, and would make a lot more sense, you know, in a single company. It's better to have four assets in one company than four single asset companies all trying to support management teams and the cost of running a business in a, in a public company. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, another good question uh, is um, asking what a one to one strip ratio would do to your all in sustaining costs. Uh, they'll be better. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't have the current numbers on that right now. Right. Um, it's uh, it's certainly in our forecast uh, for this coming year, but I'd be I'd be lying if I said I had that number memorized off the top of my head. Right. Um, so uh, you're yeah. you're kind of running in the thousand dollar all in sustainable. Probably, probably closer to eleven hundred right now with the okay. higher strip. I think if you saw our our, our our Q3 numbers, you know, as that strip ratio was starting to come up, we were sitting in that kind of range. So, right. And um, so possibly getting down to that lower strip ratio yeah. in the second half of calendar twenty twenty. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, it starts to come down kind of in mid. Uh, yeah, in, in mid calendar twenty twenty. I think. So that might, you know, push it down towards 900 yeah, or something. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but certainly yeah. a lot better than it is now. I mean, you've got a two-to-one strip versus a one-to-one -one strip. None of that waste rock you have to move makes you any money, yeah. but it still costs you money to move it. Yeah. So, so if you can eliminate that, obviously your, 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 you know, your, your revenue goes a lot farther. Okay. Uh, next question is asking to talk about the overall land package uh, of one of the largest prospective Carlin style uh, areas in Nevada and the potential for higher grade at depth and what exploration might uh, produce from drilling deeper. Okay, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, you know, the land package is quite large. It's about 200 square kilometers and it's probably one of the larger land packages and it's a contiguous land package. Um, of really any you know smaller companies in Nevada right that, now. That's huge um, for Nevada. I yeah, mean, exactly. There are operating mines that are yeah. a fraction. I, I think uh, you know Gold Standard Ventures has about the same size land package, and and you know, um, and and you know, but but really beyond that, you know, it's really only the majors that have that, that yeah. kind of extensive land package. So we think there's a lot of prospectivity there. We've barely scratched the surface of it. Um, 
I think the you know there's a lot of good exploration uh, potential at Pan along Strike. There's a there's a north south fault there called the um, the Branham Fault that controls the mineralization there and it runs all the way through uh, the, the property package there. Um, and, and we're certainly going to be testing some of those targets this year. But I think probably the the, the more exciting area is over at uh, at Gold Rock. You know, if you look at compare it to something like uh, Kinross's Bald Mountain Mine, which is just to the north of us. You know, they've got 2.2 million ounces in reserves, but it's not in one pit. It's in a whole bunch of little pits mm -hmm. uh, scattered all over the place. Yeah. And so that's kind of how we see Gold Rock uh, may mm -hmm. grow is through a series of, of nearby deposits that we can kind of all mine as a, as a single operation. Um, and so we think that's pretty exciting. But again, Gold Rock, you know, again, it's about 60% higher grades than... Uh, than pan, right? Uh, which so is why we like it as well. If obviously, you can explore yeah. at an area with sixty percent higher grades. Yeah, you're going to probably going to direct yeah. dollars towards that. Exactly. Now, one of the interesting things is this idea of d drilling deeper, because obviously up at the, you know, the, the Carlin deposits, drilling deeper there has found some really, really interesting high grade stuff. You know, particularly from uh, from Barrick's uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we we actually had last weekend we had a, a geological society of Nevada field trip come through Pan and Gold Rock with about forty uh, mainly geologists um, touring through, and uh, I was talking to our VPX yesterday, and and we've had these discussions internally. Man, wouldn't it be nice to stick a deep drill hole in here to see like what, is there a feeder structure down there? Is there something that's that's uh, you know and and you know for those of you playing. Uh, you know, small mining company bingo. You can check. I've said feeder structure, so <laughs> you can check out. Um, but you know, one of our one of our geologists at site was formerly a geologist with Barrick at Carlin, uh -huh. and she's quite keen to to stick a deep drill hole in. Now, obviously, we're focusing on the kind of low hanging fruit. You know, any uh, any ounces, any drill hole that can go into the mine plan next year are obviously the most valuable ones. But but at some point, we do want to try and stick some uh, some deeper drill holes down there. Right. Okay. Um. Uh, here's a question, uh, something I haven't thought of to ask myself, I'm sort of interested in, is asking, are there surface oxides, uh, are they not often an indicator for deeper targets? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the model that we take from Carlin, for example, mm -hmm. or from, uh, you know, some of the mines, uh, you know, further north, the larger mines. Um, and again, it, you know, you never know until you stick a drill hole into it. And uh, those are obviously more expensive drill holes. They take longer to drill. Yeah. Uh, probably need uh, slightly different rigs to uh, to get that deep. But um, but yeah, that's uh, it's certainly something we're, we're keen to do. Um, I, I just don't have a timeline for it right now. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're running short on time, so I think we'll, uh, we'll finish up here. I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to do this. And, uh, you know, we're big supporters of uh, the company here at Red Cloud, and we expect uh, to see this company grow and really transform from the ridiculously low value that it's being given in the market right now, uh, especially relative to your peers. If you look at this on any metric, it's very, very undervalued. I can't stress that enough. And uh, you're doing wonderful things, and uh, we can't wait to see more. Great. Thanks, Jake, and um, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in.